people I'm going to be talking about error preserving disk maps and they'll be smooth. Uh, and uh, before I tell you really uh, the, the structure of, what, of the talk, um, let me first just say, well, I'm going to be talking about smooth disk maps. And before I prove anything, they are sort of, even though in, they're in two dimensions, they are, the, the dynamics of these can be horribly complicated. And let me just remind you of this picture you've probably seen many times before. So uh, I guess this was the sort of behavior was known back to Poincaré, but uh, there's uh, this nice book I like by uh, Robert Mackay, and in the beginning he points out, he, he says that a few hours spent at a computer quickly convince you that error-preserving maps generically all sort of have the same features, and this is kind of, uh, I sort of copied by hand his drawing, which was a computer simulation. And uh, he points out what sort of features you might expect. And um, so, uh, so for example, he says, you know, in the middle, maybe you, somewhere you have uh, a stable fixed point. I didn't actually draw the point there. And uh, it's sort of surprising, of course, that it's stable because being error preserving, you can't have all negative eigenvalues at the linearization. So uh, nevertheless, a deep theorem KM that generically there's going to be invariant circles around this and that keeps the, the region stable. And as you move further out through these more circles, maybe eventually you come to between some of them, these sort of island chains, we've got alternating stable and unstable periodic points. And then as you go further out, he says, you typically see sort of re regions that look like uh, you're going to like chaos, so orbits whose closure maybe fills up a set of positive measure or something like that. And then uh, a very interesting feature is, is that you sort of observe that if you say pick one of these other stable fixed points or periodic points and zoom in on it, you sort of see the whole picture over again. And so, yes, that's my sort of advert before trying to prove simple things. Uh, um, and yet, although so much structure is observed, there are many uh, questions that are not answered that are even very, uh, very uh, sort of basic, like um, apparently it's not even known. I mean, that you always know there's an interior fixed point by uh, the Bra fixed point theorem, that's because it's area preserving. But it's still unknown if generically even there's, a, there's an elliptic one, provided generic means smoother than something like C2. So, uh, yeah. So, I guess one of the oldest results of air preserving sort of maps goes back to uh, Poincare. I guess the, the oldest one is presumably the uh, recurrence theorem. And then after that, uh, there's this uh, famous um, theorem about twist maps on an annulus that uh, Birkhoff uh, has proved. So, that says, remember, that if you have an air preserving map on an annulus and uh, your map, or maybe even a homeomorphism, uh, on the two rings uh, on the boundary uh, rotates them in opposite directions, then you expect to find two uh, more fixed points, two fixed points. So I'm going to formulate this in, a, in, a, in, in, in the situation where we have a disk map. So supposing yeah, psi is my actually smooth error-preserving disk map and p is an interior fixed point, then we'll say this is a, a sort of a twist point if uh, sort of the complement, if you removed out the, the, the point, is, is, has this sort of twist property. So non-rigorously, at least, the, the, the behavior of psi is to rotate in opposite directions about this. So I won't make this uh, rigorous. But um, so, and another way of saying this is once you've made a, a definition somehow of real valued rotation numbers, not just rotation numbers that are circle valued, then you could just say this would be equivalent to saying that the infinitesimal rotation number about the point is, say, the other side of an integer to the rotation on the boundary. So typically say zero if you pick your rotation numbers like this. Uh, and then I can now form, so let me call this a twist map. If there exists some p, you may not know quite where, but if there exists a p, a fixed point, such that you have this kind of inequality. Okay. And then the theorem uh, back from almost 100 years ago now is that such a map has two other fixed points besides this one where you've got the twist. So, um, so to d I'm, I'm going to talk about um, so, uh, uh, so a question I'm going to ask in a second is, what, what is a map like if it doesn't have a twist for any of its iterates? And I'm going to try and prove something uh, that relies on uh, holomorphic curves. And so I'll explain how they come into this. And maybe the, the, the sort of pictures that arise 
in this proof are maybe more interesting than the statement even, but uh, that's, that's where I'm going to go. So first, let me just observe that it's also well known, I think this is back from the 70s even, if you've got it, that once you have this result of Birkhoff, um, uh, you actually get infinitely many periodic orbits for, by st keep applying this to higher and higher iterates. And moreover, not only do you have infinitely many, but they're of unbounded minimal period. And you get uh, a lower bound on the growth rate that is the number of periodic orbits with minimal period less than or equal to n grows at least sort of quadratically. You've got some constant there depending on the map that's, that's positive. And then apparently there are examples that show uh, you can find twist maps where um, you get somehow, I mean, maybe there's an epsilon there, like you can get for all epsilon within, uh, within the right-hand side. So this is essentially uh, sharp. So uh, which maps are not twist maps? So one obvious example is the identity and rotations. It, of course, includes the identity. Uh, any rotation, it's, it's all pretty rigid. And, uh, of course, these other constructions due to Catoc, where you have a single periodic orbit that's always a fixed point, and some, somehow no other periodic orbits appearing and that there's no, there's no twisting going on. So I'd like to claim that uh, if, 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 uh, if a result about pseudomorphic curves, which still I have to write down all the details, actually is, 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 uh, holds true, then this would be a corollary to this. So, so first of all, I want to just rule out these guys. I'm going to rule these out by saying, let's suppose there's two fixed points, so I don't have to deal with, with that. So a nice way of doing that is to do this. So assume it has two or more fixed points. And then it turns out that either some iterate has a twist, or it's just the identity map. So it's uh, quite rigid. Uh, so. I guess I should say, so a, a corollary of this is that, um, so I guess there's a, a theorem of Franks from the 90s which shows that uh, if an error-preserving disk map has uh, two or more fixed points, then there's infinitely many. And he does this for homeomorphisms and there's no boundary and, and so on, so it's very nice there. And then more recently, when Handel proved uh, this uh, stronger one, which is that if there's two fixed points, not only do you have infinitely many, but they're either of unbounded minimal period or the map is the identity. So uh, you, you, you get this as a corollary with, with a better uh, a growth rate because they also say that you, they can also, you can also prove at least a, a linear lower bound. So I know the quadratic lower bound is, is true because I uh, emailed <laughs> Uh, uh, someone uh, like Calves, and he said that that was true. So um, maybe he, he said one way to do this is show that the map somehow has a, a result of his from 2008. He says, you show that a map always has either a twist or some sort of weak twist. So I don't know if that's the same as the twisting I'm talking about. It was where there's linking of orbits. So uh, I don't know whether for him it was just as obvious that you prove a twist exists. So, so I think at least that, at least the growth rate of the of, of that I'm claiming is, is, is true. Uh, right, so holomorphic curves, where did these come in? So let's consider this uh, disk map, and I'm going to view it as the return map of a flow on a solid torus. Show a little picture. Oh, oh, I see, I can click it. Okay. So I temporarily call this psi f because I couldn't do the LaTeX thing on the pictures, unfortunately, with the this Beamer presentation. So, so, uh, so, you, so you choose your flow so that this happens. And uh, let me, most of the time I'm going to open this out and view this as a solid cylinder, so the ends are identified by the identity map, not by the map itself. So the flow is not just straight lines. The, all, the, all, all the complexity of the flow is, is, is actually here in these coordinates. Um, and I'm going to try uh, claim that, uh, yeah, explain how we get an object like this. So, uh, and this is if we assume that this, um, so an important point here is to assume that, uh, is, to, is to make this flow so that it's actually uh, a Reeb flow. So that there's a contact form on this uh, uh, manifold uh, so whose Reeb flow uh, is, is generating this, uh, this map. I'll explain why in a minute. 
so, uh, so, so what, is, what is this? So, um, so, uh, so this is a, a foliation, a singular foliation. There are here, uh, these are, the, the, the sort of two-dimensional leaves here are embedded annually because the ends are identified by the identity map. They're not supposed to be perfectly straight lines like here at all. I've just drawn them like that. Uh, and if we go inside, um, it, 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 sort of the skeleton is that there's some, uh, the boundaries of these leaves are actually going to be a periodic orbits. So say that's a typical leaf there. It's an annulus connecting two periodic orbits. And another kind of leaf that appears is one that connects this uh, periodic orbit to the boundary. The boundary of the leaf in the boundary need not be a periodic orbit, but otherwise the interior ones are. Okay. And then it turns out you can construct, if it's a reeb flow, uh, this kind of uh, object actually filling up the whole uh, space. And not only is the boundary of these leaves uh, periodic orbits, but it's related to the flow in, a, in, a, in another way, which is that if we go inside, the interior of these leaves are transverse. So each leaf is a surface of section. I'm not claiming that there's a nice return map, but certainly on the interior, uh, the, um, uh, the reef field is, tran is strictly transverse. So, um, so you've got loads of, loads of these. And seeing as there's a whole, um, a whole load of them, uh, we'll call this a, a global system of surfaces of section. And this goes back to um, work of uh, Helmut and his collaborators I'll mention in a minute. So two, two po important um, features of, of these are the binding orbits. So there's the sub-collection of all the closed orbits that uh, are in there that are actually boundaries of these leaves, maybe all of them, maybe just a sub-collection. And the other is the boundary condition, which, which um, all I'm interested in, uh, for this talk at least, is um, uh, the boundary condition in the sense that th th the number of times the leaves wind around uh, uh, in, in the, the, the meridian direction as you go once in the longitude. So basically just an, a single integer describes the boundary condition. So just interested in the homology class on the boundary. So the binding orbits, if I take a transverse slice of this, would be, say, it would correspond to fixed points of the map like this. And the boundary condition, I'm just going to refer to this as an integer. So uh, zero is going to be this way, it's sort of canonically given because the, the manifold is a product. And this, say, is minus one, it's plus one, and so on. Okay. So where did these come from? <clears throat> so in the 90s, Hoffer, Wazowski, and Zainder uh, observed that if you have um, a contact form on a closed three manifold, and if you can foliate the simplectization of this, so the non-compact four manifold R cross this, uh, and you've got a, a very nice kind of uh, uh, special, almost complex structure on the four manifold, and you can foliate this by embedded holomorphic curves with a finite energy condition. So here I'm drawing that this, this, this R direction is for these, and the M is a three-dimensional sort of horizontal slice like this. Maybe you get all these curves in here, and um, so it turns out that, uh, so here, say, is it a, a cylinder? Here, this guy on the right would be a plane. Uh, and the, the finite energy condition shows that it, it goes to periodic orbits, actually, uh, as you go. Um, actually, so I wasn't going to mention this, but um, it's an important point, right? So uh, as, as you, th these go up and up, up here to all the way to infinity, and as you get up to here, the, 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 these are getting closer and closer to uh, 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 a cylinder over uh, some closed reeb orbit. Okay, um, and what I what I wanted to point out though was this observation was that um, if the foliation you get, so your whole filling of this space by these objects is invariant under this r, tra r direction uh, translating up and down. So if I go up and down, and you, these, these remain leaves. So if you have this, then when you take all, all this in the four dimensional space and actually project onto the the, the, the slice, the M, the three manifold, you actually, each leaf projects down to either an embedded surface in the three manifold or a periodic orbit. So 
like that. So this goes to an embedded uh, plane. Or, uh, well, the closure would be a peer to Corbett on the boundary. And this one, say, happens to project uh, completely just onto a closed orbit. Okay. So um, uh, some cylinders, of course, if it wasn't really uh, somehow as straight as this, it might project onto an annulus. And that's where the annuli are coming from that I'm going to talk about. So they showed, actually, that you can even construct these if your manifold is S3 and the, the contact form is the, has the standard contact structure on it. So in some cases, not even gen just generically, but full smooth ones. So, uh, so if you're replacing S3 with the solid torus and considering only, a sp only reed flows, so it's sort of simpler, reed flows for which uh, only go around like this, then I... Uh, so in my thesis, I constructed two, and they had the property that on the boundary, if the Reeb flow is somehow like this red guy going like this, then the two that you find are the ones for which the winding on the boundary is one of the closest two integers to the actual flow itself. So this one, the, f the, light, the leaves are going a bit sort of faster than the flow, and here the leaves are going a bit slower. Um, okay. And then I knew something about the conley zehnder indices of the orbits in the middle, and I could also show that they actually always, you could make sure they always shared an orbit. But beyond that, um, I didn't have so much control uh, about this. So more recently, uh, a huge improvement would be uh, this. And uh, so what, 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 what is this? This is basically saying that you can construct loads of these and that you can choose uh, two things. You can choose one elliptic orbit, and you can choose the integer describing the boundary condition. So let psi be a, assume non degeneracy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because, so, uh, because I haven't finished writing this up, and because uh, there's, there's even a, a sort of weaker version of this where I don't allow any boundary condition, but uh, all, all except for a certain range, depending on the rotation number about the periodic orbit you're picking and the behavior on the boundary. And if I, ign if I ignore that range of, of boundary conditions, then I'm uh, very confident that this is, this is OK. And if we go within those, it's easier to give a presentation. Uh, and I think it should be OK, but that's less, uh, less certain. Uh, however, you don't need those difficult values to prove the result and the corollary about uh, the Frank's handle result. Um, and that's why I haven't put a date on it. So, so you're assuming your map is non degenerate, even though all the results are trying to prove uh, uh, not assuming that kind of genericity assumption. I mean, all, pretty much if you make it non-degenerate, it's got a twist in it, so that's not very good. But you, you want to take approximations. And I'm also going to assume that it's a perfect rotation on the boundary. Okay, so uh, that is also something that seems like it should be able to re be removed. But, uh, but for the statement talking about if, uh, everything is about with, with a rotation on the boundary, the hardest case being when, when it's a rational rotation. So, and then you're free. So, so now implicitly we've got a mapping torus representing this by a, a suitable contact form. And I'm saying pick some orbit which, if, if you look at it from the point of view as, as, a, as a Reeb flow, it has odd Conley Zehnder index. Or if you're looking at it as a, as a fixed point of the return map, then just we require that it's not hyperbolic unless it's got unoriented, stable, and unstable manifolds. Uh, and then you pick any integer, and then there's a foliation containing this orbit and with this boundary condition. <coughs> so I want to, okay, so um, I'm shortly going to explain how, roughly how this, 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 this proves the statement I was claiming about maps that are not twist maps being the identity. And uh, first, let me just look closer at the uh, what you get here with the, from the foliations. So, okay, here's the, here's the, here's the holomorphic curve that uh, uh, projected downstairs. And uh, this, d just, just reviewing this, so uh, this is obviously the picture back in the closed torus, just because I want to jump around. 
And then this is the projection. This is my, uh, a different picture, of course. This is supposed to be, this is the solid torus, and then this is kind of the R direction in the symplectization. I'm saying this would be, a, say, a holomorphic cylinder, and this is the origin of the, all the leaves that we're talking about. Okay, so you've got, say, this connecting two periodic orbits upstairs, and then this projects down to an annulus, which I'm then opening out in most of the pictures as, a, as this strip. And then if you take a disk slice, this object here in the four dimensions and the two dimensions just becoming this arc connecting two fixed points. Okay. Um, so an important quantity in this is, 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 uh, is this kind of energy here where you just, you've got your contact form on the three manifold, I'm calling that lambda, and then if you just uh, d-lambda restricted to, to, to the surface, uh, the projected one or, 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 or this is always non-negative, and if you integrate this, uh, we'll call this this energy, and by Stokes' theorem, this is just going to be the two, the action difference of the two periodic orbits. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, um, uh, so this is an important point I'm going to use later. That, so clearly, by Stokes' theorem, if you took a leaf where it connects two orbits of the same action, then it would have zero energy. But it turns out, actually, if, if, if that can only happen if the two orbits are actually the same. So the Q at the bottom is actually P. Okay, so um, uh, right. So, so for the zero energy case, you've got this picture, right? You've got a perfectly vertical cylinder. It's projecting down just to a closed orbit, and then on that picture, you get it in just just a point, a fixed point. Okay, that sort of be important later on. And of course, <coughs> you get foliations not just for the first iterate, but for um, all iterates, and uh, most of them are not just lifts of ones for the first iterate. So you really get loads of these. And the almost complex structure in the background here is just periodic. It's just the same over each region. So you really do have positivity of intersections of leaves from different iterates and things. So there's hopefully a lot of games you can play with this. So a cross-section of foliation, I want to distinguish sort of two or three types of behavior. So, um, so say here is just the case you would get if, there's, uh, uh, if the foliation only has a single orbit in it. And here in this one, all the, orbi all, the, all the binding orbits have at least one leaf connecting it to the boundary. And that means that the leaves that I've drawn in, in shaded, uh, sort of which are the ones that are somehow isolated in the, uh, amongst all the other leaves, uh, ha ha having, I mean, yeah, uh, all the ones nearby have different asymptotics. Uh, then the, 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 these thick ones have uh, a form of tree-like uh, graph. And then over here, you can actually have some topology in, the, in these uh, isolated, uh, these rigid leaves. And so it turns out this kind of behavior happens when, say, this orbit in the middle is actually a twist orbit. Um, it's more or less if and only if. I mean, in the sense that if you have a closed cycle, then one of the, at least one of the orbits in there is a twist. And, and, and uh, if, it's a, if it's a twist, it won't be connected to the boundary, depending on what boundary condition you take. Um, uh, not every orbit not connected to the boundary will be a twist. Though. That's just why it's not quite a phenomenon. Uh, so, if <coughs> so, if this happens, you're, you're going to be able to conclude some twisting. If this happens, then every orbit being connected to the boundary allows you to get an estimate on the action of this orbit as, in, uh, in, as, as a flow in the three manifold because you have a leaf connected to the boundary and you know the boundary condition uh, that gives you information about, uh, about the action. And that's what I'm going to play a, a game with. Um, so this is a quick idea of the proof of the statement that if a map has two fixed points and, uh, and uh, n it doesn't have any twist uh, fixed points and none of its iterates have a twist fixed point, in order to claim that it actually is the identity map. So step zero is to show that actually uh, the rotation number on the boundary has to be uh, zero. That's just because. Uh, that's because um, 
that basically means that in the uh, that if I took a real valued rotation number, it would just be an integer. And if it wasn't, so if this was not true, if this was not zero, then the fact that you have two fixed points tells you that in the mapping torus, there's going to be some linking number between them, and that will be an integer. And so that, if that integer disagrees with the rotation number of the flow on the boundary, then you, you can play games and show that there's actually a twist. Uh, and so step zero is to say, well, uh, I'm done then if, 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 it's, if, if, if it happens to be not just an integer flow on the winding on the boundary, but actually the same one as the linking number of these two periodic orbits. So we can safely assume that there's actually an uh, integral rotation number on the boundary. And so there are fixed points on the boundary. And I'm assuming, of course, that it's a perfect rotation on the boundary, so therefore it's the identity map on the boundary. Okay. Uh, again, you know, if, 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 if the statement about the foliations went through without having to assume it's a rotation on the boundary, then the, the proof would, would, would go through as well. So it's somehow, uh, uh, in some, maybe, maybe not crucial in some sense, but maybe it is. Uh, yes. For which, uh, if 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 you're assuming that, uh, which which maps? Sorry. Uh, I suppose error preserving. Yes. I guess so. I would guess so. Uh, yeah, yes, I would guess so. so. Because yes. uh, uh, you must have, if you perturb it, that you have a hyperbolic spanning orbit inside this thing. You'd have transversal intersections of. Yes, yes. So I don't feel the so. Mm. Um, so then, uh, so then there, there's step one, and then there's one more step after this. So step one is um, to say, well, actually, all the fixed points have the same action. Where by action I mean, I mean you can you can you can. Uh, so by action I mean uh, the the time of first return in the mapping torus you've picked. So. It sounds like uh, a non-canonical kind of quantity, but I mean, up to uh, up to adding a constant to all the orbits, it's it's actually uh, independent of uh, dependent of everything, and, um, just uh, just on the return map. So you're claiming that all the fixed points actually have the same action, and this is because you're assuming there's no twisting. If there's no twisting, this basically means there's no cycles. Almost is just because if your map is degenerate and you have to make a small perturbation to make it non-degenerate, then you could pick a bad boundary condition and you would still get a cycle that you don't want to see. But basically, there are no cycles. And that means that the, any of the foliations you get are going to be tree-like. And this gives you estimates on the action. And if you just apply this to longer and longer iterates, I'm being really vague here, you end up squeezing the action between uh, the action of any of the fixed points on the boundary and plus or minus epsilon. So I mean, I'm being extremely uh, vague here, but it's, it's not, uh, there's nothing difficult. Uh, and then uh, step two is to find a finer energy foliation where every leaf actually has vanishing energy that we just talked about. And that means every leaf upstairs just looks exactly like a cylinder. And why is that? This is because, so if you go back, uh, You've shown that all the fixed points have equal action. So maybe I'll go forward. So if I could just look up here for a second. So if you have, so, you ha so, so you're in a situation basically where the map is very uh, degenerate. So you take a small perturbation to non-degenerate and take a, a you know, sequence of approximations. And then for each non-degenerate approximation, 
you're getting, of course, that the actions are not quite equal, but they're very, very close to each other. And that tells you that each leaf, they're all cylinders, uh, each leaf is um, very close to being completely vertical. And then as you take a limit, you're going from this kind of picture to this picture for every single leaf in, your, in the foliation. And, uh, and so in the end, you, you're finding, uh, I mean, the whole foliation looks like these guys. So basically every point is sitting on a, a periodic orbit where the periodic orbit is closing up once around the torus. So it's a fixed point. So basically every point goes to a fixed point. Okay, so that was, that, that was the quick sketch of the, of the proof there. So no cycles give you action estimates. You show all the actions are the same for the first iterate, and then that tells you you get a vertical foliation. So it's actually the identity map. So, uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is just some evidence that maybe there's something interesting happening, uh, not just looking for periodic orbits, but maybe uh, it, you know recurrence, pro recurrence phenomena of maybe uh, not just isolated points, but maybe more interesting things, maybe invariant circles. So. so what happens asymptotically by that, I mean, suppose you take a sequence of foliations, and these are for longer and longer, higher and higher iterates, longer. Uh, so I'm thinking of these as lo uh, longer um, tori. And I'm thinking in the limit as you may be getting a foliation of the universal cover, so the simplectization of the picture where this is an infinitely long torus in either direction. And every, all the data is periodic except the actual foliations themselves, maybe. So there's an almost complex structure sort of on the simplectization of this, and there's a contact form, the root vector field, and so on. But the leaves themselves, what is happening to those? So in general, I don't know. I mean, one of the problems is that there's an energy behind all of this, and this is growing linearly approximately as you do this. And if that happens, then the usual tricks for showing convergence of holomorphic curves don't work. So something has to, uh, there's a lot of work to be done here. But if you actually do this with an integrable map, uh, you can tell what the limit must be. <laughs> Let me just put it like that. So, so supposing H is sort of a Hamiltonian, is a smooth map, on the, a real valued map on the disk. And I suppose it's got these level curves looking, looking like this. So it is, of course, degenerate. But uh, let's assume there's just uh, some uh, four elliptic points, these dots. And then uh, there's three hyperbolic fixed points here. And then there's everything else is lying on invariant circles or these invariant uh, homoclinic uh, trajectories. And of course, each of these circles has some sort of rotation number associated to them. So, so the theorem that says, the would-be theorem that says that there would be foliations where you're allowed to pick an elliptic orbit and you're allowed to pick a boundary condition would give you the following. So let's say I pick one of these elliptic orbits. Let's say I pick uh, uh, E, I've said E4. Sorry, I think it should be E1. Oh, sorry. I'm about to pick this one here. So pick this one, and I pick an irrational number, omega. And now I say, pick Fn is a sequence of finite energy foliations. So think of those pictures downstairs where you've got these global surfaces of section filling up the tori, where the tori are getting longer and longer. So n is going to infinity. And you pick this so that the, f the fixed point E4, or its higher and higher iterates, is a binding orbit for each of these foliations. And you pick the boundary condition to be the integer to some sequence of integers so that the quotient with the number of iterates is converging to the irrational number. Then the binding orbit, it turns out, so this is the one you forced in there, and you forced the, the, the boundary condition. And it turns out then that automatically, all the binding orbits in the limit are clustered. If you took a slice, transverse slice, and looked at this, uh, are filling up uh, the blue circles are all the circles with rotation number this omega, and all the one, uh, but only the ones which enclose uh, the chosen 
uh, elliptic point. So maybe there's one of these here also has this rotation on the omega, but it doesn't separate this one from the boundary. So it turns out you're picking out all of these. And the actual sequence of foliations would seem to converge to this. So, so uh, I've thrown away the dynamics behind this. And you can just see this is supposed to illustrate these curves here are the leaves. So each of these would be a plane. It's, it's uh, sort of one, one R direction is like this. Another R direction is to infinity and in sort of this direction. And on the boundary here is, well, in the, in the, in the cylinder, you've actually got a, a, in the cylinder, you've got a torus. This is just a slice of this. And it's, if you follow each trajectory on the torus, which is, 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 is an irrational number, so you're sort of just filling this out. You're never closing up. If you follow a trajectory starting at a point on this, and you go in, then in the symplectization across all of this, you've just got a leaf that sits directly over this. So somehow the blue, or the blue ones, which are the invariant circles you're picking out with a specified rotation number, are actually being picked out by the foliations uh, by those leaves where that energy we're talking about goes to zero. And these are being connected by the sort of, uh, sort of this ladder of other leaves, so uh, filling out in between. So that seems to be what happens. So uh, this is using the integrability but of, of the original map, but somehow in a very weak sense. So be interesting to know what it can do. Uh, much more generally than just the integrable case. So that's the uh, evidence that maybe there's some interesting things going you can get out of this uh, much more generally. So, um, I mean, I'm not assuming anything like a global monotone twist or anything like that. All the twisting I was talking about was uh, sort of a weaker sense. So any invariant circles, therefore, would be uh, presumably very interesting to find. So, Okay, and I think uh, we'll stop there.